Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tata Docomo, along with its knowledge partner, DataQuest, welcomes you all to the Dubik Symposium. The Dubik Symposium is a platform to bring thought leaders from renowned organizations to discuss trends that businesses anticipate in advent of evolving technologies. One such trend is convergence of social, mobile and internet of things, which is a powerful and disruptive force that is redefining the business landscape. As technologies combine and converge to create widespread disruptions, enterprises are trying to grasp the true meaning and value. Enterprises are looking for answers to questions like how to deal with the challenge of adopting new technologies, how to make sense of the information generated by connected devices and social media and integrate all the technologies to derive true value for the organization and its customers. The Rubik Symposium this year is all about answering these questions. And this is how we have planned to achieve this. One, share industry trends that impact growing businesses. Two, encourage and nurture thought leadership by giving you the opportunity to hear what experts have to say. Three, stimulate meaningful interactions between peers and industry experts. And four, to continuously understand your needs and expectations in order to create solutions that are best suited to your requirements. We are sure by the end of this evening you will have plenty to take away from discussion by our esteemed corporate leaders and domain experts who have come from varied industry verticals. Before we start the event, please allow me to apprise you of some announcements. Please do not switch off your mobile phones, just keep them on a silent mode. We have a mobile application exclusively created for this event that will take your experience at the Doobig Symposium to a new level. Using Doobig Mobile App, you can network with fellow attendees, participate in live polls and share your responses, access the event schedule anytime, see all the speakers and read their bios. Towards the end of the event, please share your feedback. The feedback form has been made available to you through the Doobig mobile application. After the sessions, please visit the demo zones to experience some of the SMI solutions that will help you, that will help your businesses do big. And last but not the least, we request and solicit your active participation and engagement through this event. Here are a six sneak peek into what lies ahead of this evening, a keynote on harnessing the power of social, mobile and internet of things for the business transformation, a session by Tata Locomo on SMI solutions for businesses to do big, a panel discussion on how to expect of adopting SMI with an excellent lineup of panel members followed by a question answer session and we conclude the evening with networking over dinner. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now introduce you to all our chief guest for the evening, Mr. Vishal Mehta, founder and CEO of Infibim.com. With a stellar academic record, Mr. Mehta entered Cornell University where he studied operations and research and management. To pursue his dream of building technology company, after more than 10 years of his life in US, he ventured out in India and moved back in 2007 and incorporated Infibim. Infibim business includes B2C, e-retailing platform, and B2B cloud-based e-commerce technology platform. With the vision to provide a complete digital platform solution to millions of merchants and SMEs across the globe, recently Infibim has become the part of credible and secure global community that is internet. By introducing new top-level generic domain .000. We will begin our event 
with the keynote by man himself, Mr. Vishal Mehta. Ladies and gentlemen, I request all of you to please put your hands together for Mr. Mehta. So let me start by saying that maybe about 15 years ago, okay, um, if you talk about economic growth, uh, you know, at that point the only thing that came to mind was globalization. Okay? So everyone talked about globalization. They said that you know, we need to be global, you know, in the city let me be global, and in that way let me expand it to new markets, whatever I manufacture over here let me take it abroad, let me do many things and that is the only mantra for economic growth. Okay? Um, and, and I think, I believe, I mean, this is a contrarian question, okay? And, and I love contrarian questions because generally people, um, you know, how many people know what a contrarian question is? Right. Okay, I'll give you an example of that. Most people believe in X, but I think the answer is in Y. That's a contrarian question, you know, thought, okay? So everyone believes in X, but I think the future lies in Y. Okay, so I also think it's a great interview question. Okay, you know when I, I did a startup and when I was hiring people, I love that question. I ask that question all the time. And uh, you know, while globalization is going to drive economic growth, I believe that technology is the miracle. Okay, it's uh, technology which is going to drive you know the future of you know most of the enterprises. You know whether it is manufacturing, whether it is something. You know, to do with um, you know marketing, retailing, whatever you call it. You know, some piece of technology is going to be very important in terms of you know driving you know uh, productivity, growth, whatever you talk about. Yeah. So the miracle that majority of the companies, countries, whatever you call it, they're looking for is actually technology. Okay. So with that premise, you know, um, when I want to bring up my example of the the contrarian thought, which is, you know, majority of the people, they go back and think that physical detail, when I moved back about 15 years ago, physical detail was very large, right? uh, and physical detail had huge potential, even today it has huge potential as well, right? But, you know, the, the thought that comes across is that, you know, real estate being more expensive, um, you know, you know that convenience is important, it's only a matter of time, right, when people will essentially adapt online, and they'll migrate online. And, and that is a thought that we actually went forward with. You know, sometimes you have to time things in life, right? And so the three most important things for any startup or anything that you start or initiate, um, you know, there's this video that came up saying that it's always hard, right, to actually make it success. Uh, it's hard to even start. The inertia of starting is very hard as well. So the first thing that you need to do is have that ambition, correct? Uh, the passion to pursue that ambition. And then making sure that you know you can deal with adversities because that's going to continue on as well. So when we started out, we said that you know physical retail is going to be there. It is going to be large. Uh, you know there are certain things that you just can't you know perhaps you know pursue from an online frame. But even today, uh, for instance, you know I, I think it's going to be very hard to you know maybe uh, uh, you know sell a home, but you can book a home. You can sell it. Right? So it's going to be a physical you know, transaction, which is important. So we said that, you know, hey, listen, it's going to be long term, uh, you know, let's think long term. And, you know, the, the perspective there is that, you know, most Indians, they don't have connectivity, it is very hard, it is going to be continuing. And I'm talking about 10 years ago, it's not, you know, long time ago. Uh, and, and that is the commitment or that, you know, gut instinct that comes across and says, you know what, it is going to work. It has to work. Because it will take time, but it has to work. People will adapt online. They will you know, continue transacting online. And that is a bet we made about seven years ago. This is in 2007, which is that let's start 
you know, where we know that it's going to stand the test of time. It has in other countries. So let's go back and figure out how to actually make it work in a populous country like India. Uh, and, and you know, the other contrarian thing I want to talk about as well is that majority of the people think that in order to do that, you have to waste or you have to spend a lot of money. Okay. So in other words, you have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to go back and do this at scale. Uh, and it's true. Okay? So in other words, uh, you know, my point being that big every time is not good. You know, you need to create value and you need to capture that value. Both of them are very important. Okay? So um, a typical example is that airlines create a lot of value, correct? but it's very hard for them to capture value. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, there are companies like Google and many others, they're able to create as well as capture a huge portion of that value. I see a lot of people having Apple phones, okay? And, and that's a great example because they know how to create and capture value both at the same time. So, uh, we went back and said that, you know, guess what? E-commerce is very important. Yes, you would require huge amounts of corporate investment. But, let's go back and build a framework where you also know how to capture value. Correct. And, and it's hard, okay? it's not easy. Uh, but that's a commitment that you essentially start out with, saying that yes, we can build a scalable business by figuring out how to capture a huge portion of the value for yourself or your shareholders by going forward in this. So those are the two big you know, assumptions that we made in our business when we started out uh, in the beginning. And there are a lot of things that come as entrepreneurs in your way as well. Right? We also had a similar experience where people go back and say that, hey, listen, how come you're not spending too much? Right? You know, I see a lot more, you know, going around, going around, you know, us and, you know, how come I don't see a lot of, you know, branding or, you know, whatever you call it. But you have to stick to your principles, whatever you started out with, which is that, you know, how do you create and capture value both at the same time and still keep on scaling your business. So we um, went back and said, and, you know, that there are two things which are important. One is commerce and the second thing is enabling commerce. Correct? So, if you are able to figure out how to convert your expenses into assets, okay, whatever my expenses, can I make it an asset? I think that is a key, you know, what you call that, you know, perspective in terms of, you know, perhaps make, trying to make something happen or make something work. Okay? So, what we realized was that a lot of our capital was going into human, you know, resource. In other words, you know, trying to go back and hire the best developers. You know, whenever you want to make or build technology, that is what it takes. You need to go back and pay them. And traditionally, if you look at how this whole BPO industry grew out in this country, uh, majority of them, they do fabulous by the way. Okay? But the two things that they sometimes don't have is, one, they don't own the intellectual property of the technology that they create. So it's much easier for me to be able to go to somebody abroad and say, let me build whatever you want to build it. Let me do it for you. Okay? But whatever I build, that technology belongs to you and not to me. Okay? I mean, a lot of people may be you know, aware of this, that whenever you work for a client, whatever intellectual property that you create is actually the client's property and not your property. Correct? And then similarly, when you actually have to go to another client and when you request them that, you know, hey, listen, I know how to do this, but I have done that, but I have to redo it for you because that intellectual property, whatever we have created, was for other clients, correct? And so you keep on redoing it, but the intellectual property does not belong to a new company for whatever you are working from a client's contract perspective. And the second thing is that it is almost impossible to actually go back and own the customer of that particular intellectual it's almost impossible because now you go back and say that um, you know a company X built some technology for me to give it to my customers. Um, you know, but all the intellectual property is you know going to company X and not to the person who actually created it. Correct. So um, what ends up happening there is that while it becomes a very interesting profit and loss and a PL account and we can keep on doing it, but scaling it across for more and more clients becomes harder and harder over time. Correct. And, and if you actually invest or build out businesses when it gets easier and easier over time, they scale out much better. Okay? So um, when we started out, we said that, well, guess what? You need to productize it. 
if you are able to productize it and give it as a service, it's much easier than trying to rebuild it again and again for multiple clients. And um, you know, we made a bet. Okay, and I'll maybe share this. You know, in, in a in a different context, some times later in this in this talk as well. Our bet was that every business will need to have a presence on it uh, because it is only a matter of time that we have to compete for the customer. Um, I have never gone into a physical store, okay, and prepared for something that they don't have. How many people have actually gone to the store and said, "Oh, listen, you take this ten thousand rupees, you know, and you know, you go back and provide it to me later." Hardly happens. Right? Whereas in an online world, I can show you a picture and I can take your money. Okay, it's amazing. Okay, I mean, it sounds very trivial. Okay, it's very commonplace to get to that. Is actually hard. And you go back to, of course, you know, it's common sense. Of course, I know what that means. But whatever you are saying, nobody will pay you just by looking at a picture. And nobody will walk in a physical store and say, okay, you know, take my money and then you send it to me after you know, say three days or after two days. Okay? So, pre orders was very interesting. And, um, you know, what we realized was that it also gives you a negative working capital. Because there are two aspects of how Indian traders work. Uh, there is a table. I know I will pay you. You give me the mall. And there are a lot of difficulties over here. Okay? You must just go, and then I will pay you after ten days. Okay? You come and you know pay us. But there is, you know, sometimes a customer pays you after. So you capture that money. You're sitting on the money for ten days. And if you sit on the money for ten days, you can practically work like a bank. I've got 10 days of money. No, I don't want. So as I keep on increasing my volume, I have more and more money sitting in my balance sheet. That makes sense. Okay. So um, in, in financial world, they call it negative working capital, which means for any business, it's important how you are going to fund your setup. So if you look at the physical world, I need to carry in every location, I need to invest all the fixed costs, and then I have to take bank loans to be able to fund my main. This uh, cycle, and as I keep on growing more and more, I will need more and more bank loans to fund my operations. But in the e-commerce world, perhaps you can have more and more cash sitting with you as you keep on scaling. Because in 10 days, if I'm going to throw the keyword of business, then I'm going to throw the keyword in my bank. And if I'm doing 10 rows of business, then I've got 10 rows sitting in my bank. So we went back and said, this is very interesting. Um, whatever I have you to do as a company, when we start our business, whatever they are going to do, we are going to invest in people who can drive technology, which is uh, the uh, biggest uh, portion of our investment. Yeah. And it was very hard uh, tomorrow to have you know, that the human capital will be able to do that. Uh, uh, but it's also important to have a cost. Yeah. Yeah. Every company should have a cost. And what is your point? Why do you live every day? What makes you tick? Okay. And then that's the thing that will build out the culture. Because company is the culture. And it's very hard to go back and say, you build the culture. And company is the culture. You know that it's not the culture. So we went back and said, that, what is it that may make us tick? Okay. Because that is the unifying thing that everybody in the company will work on. And if you don't have that unifying thing, then you're running a PR, you're not running a company. So this is one of the property in Boston. Yeah. Um, so for example, you know, we went back and we thought very hard and we said that what is it that we should, you know, actually, you know, build out. And, and with that mindset that how do I convert my expense into assets, our really funny theme was that we saw a lot of people building websites for others. Okay. And we went back and said that can we work in a framework like a utility company? Okay? So in other words, when you think of a utility company, they produce electricity for putting an air conditioner, you don't have to pay for the power plant. You pay for what you use. Okay? The second thing was that people want their own brand, correct? Their own presence, their own brand, their own customers. So, but they don't understand technology. Because I'm in the retail framework, I know how to trade. So as a result, we went back and said, can we actually provide that framework? It's your home, 
your setup, your customers. And I will function as a unit. I don't need to be your home. So you can have your own guests and you can have your own customers coming in. And, and when we actually started thinking of it in that framework, what occurred to us was that while every single you know, framework was built out in a competitive mode, because you have to do better than others, right? Why do air bottom and air fares actually be able to avoid that, right? Where, you know, everyone competes with each other. We went back and said, no, why don't we actually, rather than eliminating all the people, empower everyone? That's a bold bet, right? Because it means I've been great traders all the way from East India country. Everyone has that, right? So our philosophy, when we started out, was three things. One is, how do we go back and figure out what business we are building? How do we make sure that we have a unifying team for everyone who joins us, which is important, okay? And that unifying team was, you know, along the lines of empowering as opposed to eliminating, okay? Let me not eliminating. And then the third thing is that how do we build out, you know, a culture where you know that it is going to stand the test of time. It's not today, it will also be in the future. And so as a result, you know, my, my you know, perspective on this is that you know, whenever we are essentially building out, and I know a lot of you, you know, uh, you know are building out some great technology as well, uh, but you know, if you look at the BPO framework, they were building for others. When you actually build out product companies, you're building it for a lot of people. And that's when the cloud comes in, and that's where you know, a lot of infrastructure can be built out, which is just not posting on the cloud. cloud. And I will separate those two things as well. Hosting on the cloud is very different than writing software on the cloud, which actually works as a service. And so as I said, those are two very interesting themes uh, that we actually started thinking about. And you know, I, I think what ended up happening through that was that we went back and said that hey listen, now I can actually go back and tens of thousands of stores use us. It took seven years, but right now we've got more than 27,000 stores on our infrastructure. Large ones as well as small ones. We start expanding that infrastructure over the um, So, if you think of what we actually end up you know, looking at, we started out being a software infrastructure company, and then we started thinking that, you know, listen, the lines are blurred because a lot of people went back and said that, you know, listen, we are also a retailer. They went back and said, yes, we are a retailer as well. And then they went back and said, well, guess what, you know, I also want you to actually go back and manage my supply chain. They go back and say, okay, cool, we'll be a supply chain company as well. And then they went back and said, listen, can we also use your warehousing and distribution and logistics? And we went back and become a logistics company as well. And then they went back and said, hey, listen, can I also use you for, you know, services, right? I want to be able to go back and give warranty. And I want to do this with products and attachments and so on and so forth. And so we started morphing. There's not in the control. The, the beautiful thing about you know, the, the digital world is that when you start out, the optionality value of what you create is immense. It goes to a point where you can't predict. I, I know where I want to go, but you also have producers who will come to you for different things. And so it keeps on compounding. And sometimes they innovate for you. We don't innovate. Business models are built out by clients. They come to us and say, can we use you for you know, X, Y, and Z purpose? So I'm going to give you two three examples of that. The first one is, there's a, there's a company, there's a phone company, I don't believe really that a lot of people actually use their phones. Okay? They wanted to go after the enterprise business. Okay? So in other words, they wanted to have, uh, you know, a lot of people used Blackberry. Okay? And they went back and said, can I essentially go, how do I target people who are behind the company? Uh, so in other words, I've got an infinite thousands of people. So how do I target people Behind the three you know, what do you call that? Umbrella. Because they're also users and they also get phones. Uh, and so, as a result, they went back and said, How do we do it? And they said, Can we come up with a framework where um, only if I'm an inferior employee can I get in? And then I want to run 10,000 different promotions. I'm not kidding, 10,000 different promotions at 10,000 different companies simultaneously with central CRM, central accounting, central monitoring. And we went back and said, yes, we could do that. And I'm promising you, they were able to go back and practically wipe out that market. Because 
people do care about brands, people do care about brand dilutions, people want to make sure that you know, listen, my brand is not diluted by just discounting a product. I want to give value to a, a customer. And so they were able to go back and reach out to such consumers that they were not able to reach out before. Uh, and what we realized in this world is that everyone actually builds the same phone in terms of specs. Okay, you still have the same processor, you have the same operating system, a similar one, and they start competing with each other, and the only way to compete was on pricing, correct? Because a lot of people go back and say, you know, listen, I can get it at a lower cost compared to someone else. And, and when you actually start thinking of that, that's a bad way to make money, correct? But then business models start competing, and people use the software frameworks to create a model so that economically they are much better off than someone else, correct? And that is what actually started spurring out more and more ideas. So when I talk about 30,000 stores using us, everyone uses us for a very different requirement of them. They innovate, we don't. We provide an infrastructure, and it's amazing what you can do with it, correct? Which brings me to a point about web, mobile, and social. I think one thing, and I'll leave you with this part, one thing which is happening in this space is, that it's very hard to differentiate what you are doing as a company. Earlier I could say this is a hardware company, this is a software company, this is a services company. Everything was very clear. Now it's very hard. You know, I mean, I think, you know, with Microsoft, you know, if you look at the higher, the larger ones, Microsoft's bought Nokia, Google's bought Motorola, correct? And, and so as a result, the lines are very blurred. Well, what company are you? Apple's actually a software and a hardware company both as well. And so as a result, there's a lot of, in some ways, convergence happening, okay? Convergence in terms of the kind of portfolio of products that you offer, correct? And I'm telling you, maybe 10 years ago, I could separate them out. Today, I can't, okay? And, and so, um, if you also look at, you know, the other side, I think um, telcos are becoming banks. Okay? I mean, it's very hard because telcos are payment engines, right? And so you go back and think, I mean, now you imagine that side of the world because of technology, what it does, that everyone converges. I also want to be a payment bank. Okay? I can essentially, I know how to get payments because I can do micro payments, I can do many more things, right? You can keep my money with. When is the last time someone went to a bank? And I'm telling you, it's you know, almost you know, ancient. Okay? I mean, you practically do anything. All I need, and, and I see a world not far away where somebody will perhaps come and say, you know what, just replace your card with a phone. That's all you need to do. You don't need a card. And then all I can do is a free connectivity for anything that you actually want to accomplish. Okay? So, so what I'm saying is even that convergence is happening okay, at that level. And so as a result, everyone goes back and you can't figure out that are you a mobile telco or are you a bank. And I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but it's much faster than we think. Okay? and vice versa. Okay. So I think there's a lot of convergence happening and, and I personally think that in that world it's going to be very competitive and the more you are able to, that's why this whole concept of big data, okay, analytics, being able to go back and predict you know, what you're going to do before you actually do it. Correct? I mean, those things are differentiators. Correct? So while the whole trend of what is happening globally and across us, okay, is all about convergence, the future is actually in divergence. You have to be different. You have to do things differently. And the unique thing about this whole technology digital framework is that the moment you actually do something different, there is a chance someone's going to do exactly what you're going to do. Correct? It happens all the time, right? And I love it. I mean, if you actually look at you know, all this devices, you know, I love the way your device looks, I'm going to actually go back and talk to a similar device. So the whole idea is that everyone, while the current trend will always be about convergence, okay? convergence will be extremely competitive. <coughs> and the only way you do things differently is what is going to separate you out. So the future is in divergence. And it is not one time. You have to continuously do it differently. You will be ahead of the curve. Right? So in other words, it's not just one time, I'm going to do it differently, leave. It's not that, because somebody will end up doing exactly what you're doing in some way, shape or form. So you'll be continuously be different. Okay. 
they'll leave you with a tag thought, which is, you know, you have to be different. Uh, the second thing I want to really take away or have you take away is, and, and we do it by the way, just so that you know, okay? Because we don't rely just on, you know, this framework and let me go back and do it. Now I want you to go back and have your own mobile app. And I want you to have your own social presence and so on and so forth. And the, the second thing is that much like the physical world where territories are divided, okay? People go back and say, this is my territory and this is your territory, correct? If I come to your home and announce, then your territory is defined. In a digital world, that is started. So what I find in Google is not what I find in Facebook, is not what I find in WhatsApp, is not what I find in LinkedIn, is not what I find in Zynga, which is a game company. Those are all ecosystems. They don't talk to each other. I need to go between these ecosystems to be able to go back and address. There was a time that I could do everything in Google. I would find everything that I wanted to find there, correct? But not so, you know, maybe in the next few years it won't be the same. Because this digital world is also built by humans, and in that, there is a chance that these ecosystems they don't talk to each other. What happens in Apple framework, I will never know. It is very different than what is happening in other worlds. And so as a result, it's important that you are able to go back and identify what potentially may happen, correct? And build out a solution so that you are able to go back and address that requirement, you know, of users, of companies, you know, of maybe, so because you're betting on a, on, a, on a perspective which is going to perhaps, it's already happening and continue happening in the future as well, because that's how humans think, correct? Uh, so the third thing is that all this content that you build out, okay, it's built by humans, right? These platforms, they allow you to share this content, correct? But in the physical world, for whatever content I create, I get paid. If I go back and ask you, that, can you do a creative for me? Can you actually build out an image for me, correct? Or can I go back and have a beautiful creative for this ad? I do get paid. In the digital world, as individuals, you don't, correct? Because these ecosystems, they build out this sharing framework where they get paid by allowing you to use it. They give it to, for, to, for free, but you really don't get paid. I, I do believe that in the next one or two years in India, I think there is a chance that, because India is very populous, okay, the two largest, uh, if you think of the largest democracy, if you will, most of the people are over here. So the fact is that there is going to be a chance where people, there is a framework where people start getting paid for what they do. I, it's already started somewhat, correct? There's a billion people, they all share content. There's a chance that you'll get paid for what you do. Today you don't. Correct? So genie is in the body. If there's a way to essentially unlock it and bring it out, I think it's beautiful. It can work. Okay? And so as a result, I think that you know, that's going to be an interesting trend. Is there a way where whatever content you create, you are getting paid for that content? Okay? And then I think that you know, for a country like it, because a lot of other countries where there's a huge amount of population, they're, they're almost you know, it's invisible. You know, I think Google doesn't operate in that country. Correct? But, but in this, you know, there's a possibility that you actually can because a lot of activity, a lot of users on Facebook and WhatsApp, they come from India. And, and you are able to go back and, and drive that monetization as well. And, and, and finally, I think that, um, you know, um, if you look at, you know, maybe, you know, this whole, you know, convergence between web, mobile, and social, and so on and so forth, the, the fact is that it's only web. Okay, so in other words, you know, there are different user interfaces. Where the end is internet. And the reality is everything is internet. Correct. And, and yes, you know, there's different experiences that you can provide using all these different mediums and all these different types. And then the users who are there across all these different implementations, though it be social networking sites, though it be, you know, say for example, all these closed social networking sites, so on and so on, but they're users. You want to be able to go back and have users. So companies will have to set up the digital embassies in each of these ecosystems to be able to address the user because users port between different economies, correct? Just like in a physical world, if an Indian citizen goes to the US and there's an Indian embassy, then you can get help. Similarly, I think in the digital world is somewhat similar. When you are able to create your own embassies in each of these closed ecosystems, then you're able to address your user because users port. And at the end, it's only internet, seriously. I don't think we, we as a company, I, mean, I, I wish I can tell you, I think in the short term there's going to be some perturbations because people go back and say, I can provide an experience that you can't get, you know, using, you know, what you're doing in the web framework. But I think if you actually abstract it out, 
and say, listen, what are you actually going back and thinking of? It's actually the web. And then there are business models. Are they going to be closed, open, closed ecosystems or open ecosystems? Some people believe everything is going to be open. Some people think it's going to be closed. In that ecosystem, how do you create a differentiator? Are you going to do exactly what other people are doing or are you going to do something different? Are you going to continue doing it or are you doing it one time? One time is one pay. We believe it's going to be continuous, which means you have to continuously reinvest back into what you're building out. And then the last thing is, how much of that value do you want to capture? Because you know you create huge amounts of value. But do you want to capture that value? That is going to be the, 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 the thing where you have to spend majority of your time, effort, and energy on. Okay? I think you've heard about the cloud. I won't talk much about the cloud. I know there's going to be continuously some conversation happening around that as well. Okay? But um, you know, I personally think that you know, if you're able to build intellectual property for your own company, capture most of the value, and keep on reinvesting back into building things that will differentiate you in the future, I expect that will be you know, what will stand the test of time. You will also see some companies who don't do that, they will capture huge, you will see a lot of profits being captured. You know, and I hate to say it, but it does happen in traditional media industries as well, like newspapers, right? And if they don't adapt, there's a sudden heart attack. Because one fine time, you have all this fixed costs and you don't have a business model to perhaps work. And so as a result, if you don't, I, I think you'll have to keep on reinvesting back into what you do so that you're able to make a difference, okay? Um, I think I'll leave you with this thought. I know it's a fantastic evening. I know that there's some great presenters as well, you know, after me and some panel discussions as well. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for sharing such insightful information and your idea on Do Big. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Mr. Mehta. May I now request Mr. Pratik Pashine, President, Tata Dogomo Business Services, to hand over the memento to Mr. Mehta. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have some huge round of applause for our dignitaries? Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mehta. Thank you, Mr. Pashine. Before we proceed further, we have a snap poll for you. Please go to your mobile application and click on live poll one and enter your repose. You all have downloaded the mobile app. In that, you have to go to live poll one and enter your repos. Are you using any of these solution in your business operations? One, social media. Two, mobile apps. Three, internet of things. And four, none of this. In case if you have any queries, please raise your hands. which we have in front of all of you. We have 22.8% in social media, 31.3% in mobile application, 36.1% internet of things, 
and 10.7% have chosen none of this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, moving on to the next session, may I now call upon Mr. Sai Pratyush on stage for his session on SMI solutions for businesses to do big. Mr. Pratyush is Head, Product Lifecycle Managed Services at Tata Docomo Business Services. He has over 18 years of experience in product development of which 12 plus years have been in telecom. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can I please hear him out for Mr. Sai Pratyush. Uh, then this phenomenon called social media 
entered our lives, and suddenly uh, everybody became a potential publisher. Sitting out here, you can update your blog, you can write, uh, you can communicate, uh, and and this suddenly this tool, this mobile phone, suddenly became a very powerful tool, uh, you know, in everybody's hand. There are a lot of there are a lot of stories that would remain hidden uh, if social media was not around, and people and enterprises started understanding the power uh, that this particular platform, this particular tool, uh, can you know uh, can give uh, to their business in terms of an impetus. So what's what's next? Is this the big thing, or is there something else that can change our lives uh, dramatically? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's called the Internet of Things, uh, where we're talking about a connected world, we're talking about everything getting connected, whether it's uh, your refrigerator at home, uh, you know, or it is, uh, uh, you know, your door, uh, or, uh, you know, as, as simple as, uh, uh, you know, the, the washing machine or any electronic gadget that you might use uh, today. So, the Internet of Things, and, and I'll just spend a minute out here, uh, has really moved uh, beyond automated meter reading and energy and location-based services that you know have found traction as far as the Indian market is concerned. Uh, the government of India and Gujarat here is is actually leading the way as far as smart cities is concerned. Uh, the government of India has has uh, you know allocated a tremendous amount of funds. Uh, for the development of smart cities, which means that every aspect of our life uh, in terms of dealing with government agencies, uh, municipal bodies, uh, can get automated in some form or fashion. And that will bring a lot of transparency, that will bring a lot of power uh, to the common man in some sense, because uh, you know access to information, access to reaching out to higher uh, you know, to the relevant bodies is something that all of us today may find uh, is, is a gap. Uh, then there's healthcare. Uh, we, we've had numerous instances uh, across the country, across the globe, where Internet of Things has impacted healthcare in a positive manner. You have post patient care, which was traditionally reactive, now uh, being proactive in the sense that uh, you have situations where, uh, you know, customers. Uh, or sorry, uh, you know, people who go through, let's say, heart surgeries, uh, get discharged from hospital. There's always a worry of a relapse. Today, simple sensors can be attached uh, to, you know, uh, to their body, and these sensors can transmit information on a real-time basis to the doctor or the nurse who's sitting in a faraway hospital monitoring the progress of the patient. Anything uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, the doctor or the nurse can take uh, can take proactive action. So incredible impact that uh, uh, the Internet of Things is really uh, is is you know providing uh, in the healthcare space. Another interesting area is uh, is actually retail, and what we've seen uh, is you know uh, retail companies, FMCG companies across the country, across the world, not not necessarily in India, have deployed. Uh, smart sensors, technologies, to figure out how they can get their stock to the market, their products to the market quicker, uh, you know, when uh, there is a need for it. Uh, the industry uses billions of dollars because these, uh, these uh, supermarkets are not, uh, are not stocked with the relevant, uh, uh, relevant products. So today, uh, you deploy sensors, uh, an FMCG company can, can you know, uh, can figure out that okay, there is no stock left in this particular uh, in this particular uh, uh, store. So let me send someone uh, send, uh, send someone uh, uh, you know with the, the relevant uh, product. Uh, in India, you have uh, some of the largest FMCG companies deploying uh, these technologies uh, for you know monitoring uh, the stock uh, that is stored in busy coolers. So uh, you know your your soft drink giants, uh, they use methods like door opening and door closing of the busy cooler, which you know stores their uh, soft drinks to figure out uh, how many uh, times the door has been opened, uh, you know, and how, how many times the bottle has been removed. So, if let's say that refrigerator 
has the potential to stock 300 bottles, then when it's about 80, 85, you know, you have someone go down to, uh, to that particular retail outlet and replenish the stock. So a lot of work uh, that is possible, a lot of interesting projects that uh, we are also part of, where you know, uh, the Internet of Things is really impacting uh, lives in a positive manner. So uh, do, we, do we believe that it's just going to be the Internet of Things that is going to be the next technology uh, disruption, or is there something else? Well, that's, that's essentially the topic of the day today. SMI. Uh, and in, in our view, the coming together of all of these technologies, these platforms, uh, these disruptions, uh, is what is going to make the difference in the future. Uh, mobile, you've seen the power of mobile with social media. Just imagine, uh, you know, when, when the Internet of Things uh, becomes a little more widespread, uh, the combination of these three, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to fathom the kind of impact, the coming together of all these three technologies is going to have in our lives. Um, so I'm going to spend the next few slides talking about uh, how uh, you know, these technologies can benefit the enterprise. Not too much time, but just to give you an idea of the, the work that we have done with customers across the country uh, in this space. So uh, all, of, all of us uh, deal with customers and employees on a day-to-day -day, uh, day basis. And if you're dealing with customers and employees, then these are the typical questions or challenges that each one of you, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure is dealing with. Uh, you want feedback on a real-time basis from customers uh, and employees. You want to be able to collaborate with them. You want to be able to make sure that the information that is exchanged uh, between employees or between customers and employees is done so uh, in a secure manner. Uh, how do you engage uh, your employees? How do you motivate them on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, and, and generally, how do you keep one step ahead of what they're thinking? Because if you're if you're one step ahead, then you're able to plan, then you're able to make make sure that as an organization uh, you meet their requirements. So in the era of uh, in the era of uh, WhatsApp and uh, other technologies, uh, what, what we are essentially also doing is, uh, is working on a collaboration tool uh, which we would like to offer customers very shortly. Uh, you know, a, a secure collaboration chat messaging platform which will allow you uh, and your employees to engage with each other uh, in, in a very secure manner, uh, you know, collect feedback, collaborate uh, jointly, develop products, solutions, and, and generally ensure that uh, everyone who's part of that platform, uh, you know, uh, is, is in one step, sorry, is, is, is really, uh, you know, engaged and motivated as far as the organization is concerned and its goals are concerned. Uh, all of us deal with uh, uh, a mobile workforce, whether it's 10 people, or 15 people or a thousand people typically face these challenges. Uh, as, uh, as an organization, as management, you would like to know what that employee is doing uh, at any given time of the day during his work hours. You'd like to know, uh, you know, uh, uh, is, he, uh, is he doing the best he can in terms of productivity, in terms of efficiency, and obviously, uh, you know, from an organization perspective, you would like to save costs, you would like to ensure optimum and best utilization of the manpower. Uh, in the previous poll that was conducted, you saw the power of real time. I mean, uh, sitting in this audience, uh, if I would take your feedback, the traditional way I would have gone, asked a question, uh, I would have maybe covered 20 of you and, you know, uh, uh, developed uh, a theme or a conversation, right? But today, uh, uh, 150 of you can on a real-time basis share your feedback with us and that can be projected uh, on the screen without any one of us uh, out here manipulating that information. So the power of real-time information is what we're talking about and, and as organizations, if we can leverage that, 
uh, when it comes to mobile workforce, then, then we are, we're talking about the potential to do incredible things, right? Um, so the whole concept of Uber or Meru Caps, you want something, uh, you know, now. And uh, that can be applied to a workforce as well. So if you are in the servicing space, uh, service ticket management space, or if you're uh, running an organization that has a large sales force, you don't want to wait uh, to send uh, your employee to meet the customer, uh, you know, when maybe he's not there. You want to send him when he's available. You want to send him when he has that particular problem. So that's where uh, solutions that, that we have uh, at Tata Docomo uh, can be provided. Uh, we have solutions in the uh, enterprise mobility space that cover a host of areas, right from direct sales to indirect sales to collection workforce and even market research. Uh, market research, uh, you know, uh, uh, companies deploy large workforce that go around with a pen and paper, uh, collecting information, feedback, and that can be manipulated. Uh, mobile apps that we've deployed for customers, uh, you know, uh, in the market research space ensure that, you know, this particular uh, interviewer now goes with a smartphone or with a tablet. All his information is fed directly into that tablet, into that application, and uh, it can be accessed by someone on a real-time basis. Uh, look at the power uh, of that same application if it is deployed for someone uh, in the insurance verification or in the collection space, right? Uh, uh, especially in rural India, uh, collections of money, uh, NBFCs, etc. Uh, the biggest risk that they run is one, not knowing how much of money is collected on a real-time basis, and two, if that money is collected, uh, is the employee uh, going to make sure that he deposits that money uh, you know, uh, uh, at, at the headquarters. Uh, with mobile applications, companies can now rest easy. Uh, they don't have to worry because, you know, as and when that activity happens, that information is updated to the head end server and, you know, you have information again on a real time basis. So that's as far as uh, mobile applications is concerned. Uh, the next bit uh, is, is really, uh, you know, related to vehicles. And anybody who deals with the trans, uh, you know, deals with transport of goods or people, uh, you're you're typically facing the same challenges, the same questions again. Uh, you know, are my vehicles being used uh, efficiently and properly? Uh, you know, if you're uh, in the construction space, uh, road transport, are these vehicles being deployed and being used for the purpose that they were supposed to? Well, today you have location-based services which. Uh, you know, are across a host of uh, uh, vertical requirements uh, in the sense right from DPOs uh, to logistics companies uh, to asset tracking companies, uh, taxi management, fleet management. These are solutions that, uh, you know, are today available from us and, and we've deployed them successfully for customers uh, across the country. Uh, so. I want to do, just spend uh, a few minutes, and, and I promise you it's just going to be a few more, uh, talking about uh, you know, what we call the mantras of success. Uh, we've been in this space now, uh, we moved up the value chain, we moved up from selling just capacity, we now provide uh, complex solutions to customers. And in the last couple of years, what we've done is met with hundreds of customers across the country. Uh, we've had the good fortune of working with some, uh, being their service partners, and for, for the rest, we've, we've kind of uh, dodged their feedback, understood what solutions they've implemented, and tried to learn from their experience. Uh, so the next couple of slides, uh, what we've done is we've tried to articulate uh, what we believe uh, are solutions, or uh, is, is an approach that is ideal for customers to deploy. Uh, these, are, these are thoughts, these are feedback that we gain from customers who have seen successful implementations uh, of you know, uh, IoT and, and enterprise mobility, and we thought this would be important uh, from your perspective. So the first um, mantra for success is really what we call, uh, when you look at deploying these solutions, uh, please ensure that you go down the path of deploying device vendor agnostic solutions, which means that you're not dependent on a single device OEM. Uh, 
what, what we've seen is a lot of customers who face challenges in, uh, you know, uh, IoT or end-to-end uh, uh, -end or uh, enterprise mobility applications. Uh, this, this is one big problem. Uh, so you will go to a particular, you have a particular business problem, you want a solution, you go to an OEM, uh, he provides you with a device, uh, you deploy it uh, for a few hundred, five hundred, um, uh, you know, uh, numbers, and then as years pass by, you realize that you need to deploy more, you need to move up uh, uh, in terms of scale, and the partner that you had, uh, you had deployed with doesn't necessarily have those capabilities because he's not only providing uh, the device to you, but he's also providing the application to you. Uh, it's important to separate the application from the device uh, on the first day itself because uh, when you do that, uh, then you're ensuring uh, one, you're not dependent on that sim uh, single vendor, and second, you're you're actually investing in the application, not necessarily in the device because. The device you will get a plethora of device, uh, devices to meet your requirements. But as far as the application is concerned, that application uh, is, is actually going to grow up, uh, you know, in, in some sense uh, and evolve as, as you go down uh, the path. The second is evaluate the cloud. Uh, customers have traditionally, uh, you know, been averse to deploying uh, solutions on the cloud for various reasons whether it's security, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, just comfort, plain comfort. We believe